includes commentary and conversations about issues relevant to clinical psychology. It is intended to educate, entertain, and enlighten, and is not a substitute for actual mental health treatment. Individuals who share personally here choose willingly to tell their stories to benefit you, the listener. All other references to clinical situations are altered or limited to protect confidentiality. For more specific questions or help with a personal situation, please consult a local mental health professional. Therapy. Mental health real life. This is Psych Rally with Los Angeles-based clinical psychologist Dr. Martin Shaw. Welcome to Psych Rally. Thank you for tuning in. This is episode six and is being sponsored by Fuller Psychological and Family Services or FPFS in Pasadena, California. FPFS is the counseling and training clinic affiliated with Fuller Graduate School of Psychology and Fuller Theological Seminary and offers sliding scale services to the local community. Uh, On a side note, both myself and our guest today have previously worked and trained here at FPFS, so uh, I think they provide some some good clinicians and, and certainly offer great training as well as providing valuable therapy and assessment services. You can learn more about FPFS on the show notes for episode six here on the Psych Rally website or directly through the Fuller School of Psychology website at www.fuller.edu. Okay, joining me today in the rally is my friend, Miss Kristen Fort, soon to be Dr. Kristen Fort. (laughs) One day. One day. That's like a year away, you know, you realize. It's true. That's coming up soon. uh, Because... uh, Kristen's going to be earning her PhD in clinical psychology and is off soon for her pre-doctoral internship. Uh, so congratulations, by the way, Thank on, you. on matching for that. Um, let's just say briefly where you're going to be going and what you're going to be doing there. Yes, I am going to the Chicago Area Christian Training Consortium. It's okay. a mouthful. A, yeah, it is. Just outside Jeez. of the city Bless of you. Chicago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's outside Chicago. How about that? I know. It's one of my favorite cities in America. That's so. great. Good. So that'll be fun. And uh, say a little bit about the training program and who you're going to be seeing there. Yes. Yeah, so I will be splitting my time actually between doing psychotherapy with uh, kids, adolescents, adults, and then also doing psychological and neuropsychological testing. So that's so what, also a mouthful. So what won't you be doing there is Yeah, pretty question. much. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, you're also working on your dissertation, I which am. will be defended in a few months here. Yes, that's right. Okay. And say a little bit about what that project's about. Yeah. So I love psychology, obviously, but my other passion is actually theology. Mm-hmm. And so I am doing an integrative theoretical dissertation, which Yowzers. means... Simply, I'm not collecting any data, and I'm going to be writing a theory about how parts of psychology and parts of theology fit together. I'll be actually looking at the attachment relationship between humans or just people and God and how affect or emotion fits into that. So. Right, so an attachment theory, right, and how we... It's a hard one. It's kind of like how we relate to God. How we um, relate to God as an attachment figure, mm-hmm. drawing off sort of the Bowlby and Ainsworth, Ainsworth work. That's exactly on infants' right. attachment to caregivers, right? That's exactly in right. In times of distress. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Okay. And I'll be drawing actually a little bit on a contemporary relational psychoanalysis, mm-hmm. inner subjective systems theory. Stolero. Another mouthful. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, Stolero and Donna Orange and kind of integrating some of their theories into the dissertation as well. Okay, so look out for that in the journals of theology and psychology coming out in the next few years. That's right. Miss Kristen Fort, F-O-R-T. Um, and by the way, for people who don't know, uh, earning a PhD in clinical psychology is a really long road, right? Yeah, it really is. So, right, it's years of coursework, supervision, research, you're learning about statistics, research methods, you're learning about psychometrics. And oh my gosh, yes. Testing measures, clinical training. That's right. All the different models of being a psychotherapist, different working in different settings. Mm-hmm. And uh, not, not to mention the experience of <laughs> learning how to do those well. Exactly. Right. It's so. A lot. Yes. So, and so this is an interesting thing. See if you agree with this. I sort of think of finishing a PhD or a doctoral degree in in clinical psychology as you know it's a long road, and at the end there's sort of these two crowning 
<laughs> accomplishments, right? Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. a dissertation. Yes. And there's matching for and completing your pre-doctoral internship, which is your sort of first full-time, and it's one year training position prior to finishing your That's degree, right. right? So you're on the verge of doing both of those, That's which right. is awesome. Now, I liken the two of those to getting engaged <laughs> and planning a wedding and having a wedding, That's right? Awesome. And so because it's like, you know, matching for internship is such a big deal. The application yes. process, you go through interviews, yes. it's a long process, but it's exciting. Mm -hmm. And then when you're matching and you're going off and you're going through it, you're wide eyed. You're just like, I've learned all this stuff in the classroom, so <laughs> right? I want to do it. It's exciting. It's new. <laughs> There's all this possibility and, and future. Mm -hmm. And then you got to plan the wedding. Oh my gosh. Which to me feels more like doing a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> and true. presumably, hopefully, you know the outcome, exactly. right? So I'm going to get married and hopefully the day will be fun. Family, friends will be there. Exactly. But, oh God, planning a wedding. <laughs> Details. I haven't done it, seating. But right. Yes. <laughs> sure. Well, I'll, I'll, you take my word for it, right? <laughs> seating arrangements, flowers. Oh, good Lord. It's like writing a dissertation can feel like that long, slow, uh, unglamorous. It's true. Process. It's so, so true. Uh, but anyway, so you're you're going to do both of those soon. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, Kristen, you and I met, uh, I think, what, f I'm thinking about three, four years ago. Yeah, maybe uh, a little bit longer, actually. Something like while. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. we were both uh, serving on the board of directors for our local psychological association, mm -hmm. SGVPA. I think you were the coming in as a student leadership chair, co-chair at the time. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. Right? Uh, yep. I was a student representative. Um for two years, actually three years, and then handed right. it off just recently. So That's right, yes. Yeah. And I think at the time I was one of the co-membership committee chairs. Mm -hmm. And I think when we met and you told me you were from Detroit, I've never <laughs> been to Detroit, and I just made a bunch of jokes about <laughs> M&M &M and 8 Mile, and you laughed, and that was good enough. Yes. We hit it off from there. Um, and then we were also, about a year ago, involved with a project together called mm -hmm. Moments of Meaning. Mm -hmm which was, uh, well, why don't you give your take on that? I, sure, yeah. sure. Moments of a Meaning is an excellent, just a wonderful idea that was put forward by Dr. Ryan House, I think both a friend and colleague Mutual of both friend, of yeah. ours, mm -hmm. and supervisor and mentor. He is for uh, me as well. <laughs> for me as well, too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so he had this grand idea a couple of years ago that psychotherapy is this amazing experience that a lot of people don't really know about. And it's or, really... Or think they know some things about it. Maybe also have some true. inaccurate also true. ideas. Yeah. They see things on TV or on mm -hmm. movies, and they think they have an idea of what it's like to be in therapy. Mm -hmm. um, but often they don't really, or the things they know sometimes aren't very good and yeah. so he wanted to get a chance for people um, just to hear some stories of what happens in therapy and especially about what makes it meaningful um, and so he gave a bunch of us or a few of us I guess a chance to tell stories of our experience either as a therapist which is really exciting and one of us even shared what it's been like for us as a client ourselves and um, that's really phenomenal Do yeah, it was. Dr. Joe Dilly our, our friend and colleague yeah. exactly yeah, so we both had the chance to do that. Um, yeah, that I felt super honored to be asked by Ryan. The, the fact that my story was selected kind of shocked me. I um, I really? wrote my story, and I was like, okay, good. Now I've, I've gone through the motions. I submitted it, and I probably won't get asked. And then he was like, yes, you were chosen. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Um, I had such a wonderful time. You're like, this time. is real? This is really going to happen? <laughs> exactly. I thought exactly. this was just for fun, right? Exactly. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No, I actually got to get up there behind the mic. And, exactly. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah, but it's a wonderful opportunity to tell a story about an amazing time I had um, with a client and what made it meaningful for me, what it made it meaningful for the person, um, and also just to give me some time to reflect on my journey of learning and supervision and growing yeah. as a clinician. So, yeah. yes, Kristen did a great job. You can check it out at momentsofmeaning.org. It's also on YouTube. There are uh, six stories told on there. Really, really well done, really uh, if I don't say so myself. But I mean, the, the <laughs> editing and production yes. uh, and the sound came out really good. Mm -hmm. And there's a round two coming up later this year. So yeah, check out momentsofmeaning.org. Yes, that's right. You're going to be there? Oh, you might not be I here. I won't. But I'll right. be listening. I'll be listening You're gonna be and in watching Chi -town on YouTube. You're going to be in Chi-Town by then. That's right. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Uh, so, by the way, I just have to say again, I mean, it, it's nerve-wracking enough to get in front of the camera. No, you're going to be <laughs> taped or performing and all that. But for a student, mm -hmm. right? I mean, early on in your training and to get up there, I just say, I and, and I've told you this many times. But <laughs> you have. I think you did a really good job. That Thank takes you. major uh, guts. It's, Thank you. It's the word that Thank I'll you. use. <laughs> I was thinking of something else, but I'll say guts. Yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> courage. How about courage? There we go. There we go. <laughs> 
Great. So uh, a couple other questions to get to know, Kristen. If there is, you know, as a psychologist in the making, um, going through your training so far and now going off to your advanced training, is there a book in the field that in particular you really just resonate with and or just think it'd be good to highlight for the audience? Sure. Um, there are actually two books that come to mind, okay. um, and I'll mention them in the order that I encountered them. Okay. So the first not, one... Not an order of... Uh, <laughs> of importance. Of importance. <laughs> They're both really valuable for sure. different reasons. Right. <laughs> but the first book I'm thinking of is a book with a simple title, Boundaries. Yeah, And I think right. you've heard of it as well. Uh-huh. Cloud and Townsend. <laughs> They've right. come up on the show before, and uh, they can be very, very validating yeah. for... Uh, people that are involved with well, actually, I'm, why am I talking? You're well, talking about the book. I Sorry, I, I could have just taken that and run with it. Don't let me do that. I'm enjoying the book. <laughs> I really love the book Boundaries. Um, I discovered it when I was in high school, and right. I didn't know anything about psychology mm-hmm. at all. Um, and my parents had the book sitting on their shelves, and I knew I needed to learn something about boundaries. I was always giving, always listening, and I never had time. And mm. I wanted to figure out what might be going on. And so I picked up the book, and I read it so slowly actually it's a really Hmm. random fact but I was fascinated by every single paragraph and so I would read super slowly going wow you just wanted to absorb everything every word every period (laughs) when I go back and look at the book um, I see that every single page is highlighted and I have to choose like I'm not going to highlight this section because it looks like I'm highlighting the whole page why are the pages of this book yellow (laughs) exactly oh the whole thing is yellow my gosh I highlighted right right yellow yeah (laughs) <laughs> um, so anyway, that book is great. Um, I had no so- psychological training at the time, um, and I understood everything they were talking and you about. you just could relate to it. Exactly. Yeah. And so I definitely recommend um, the book for anyone who's not been very exposed to psychology. And then on the flip side, if you do have some exposure, even for me now, I have lots of exposure and, and more to go. Um, I still think the book reminds you of some fundamental truths about relationships with others and knowing yourself. And yeah, it just really helpful. So. And for people who are in Christian circles or not. Yes, that's exactly that, right. right. That's yeah. exactly right. Okay. Um, and they talk about that in the book as well. They do right. come from a Christian perspective, but um, they try and make sure they're really open. And I yeah. think they do a genuinely good job of that and yeah. making it applicable, not just relevant for religious audiences, which is very significant to me as well. For sure. Um, and, I, and I might even think for a, a non- Christian reading some of those books, they might actually be refreshed by hmm. some of the things they talk about. I mean, they're they're not um, approaching a lot of Christian platitudes with kid no. gloves, right? I mean, that's <laughs> a lot of what they're doing is really um, sort of reframing they some are. of the things you they might are. hear. That's exactly right. Or messages you've gotten that's in exactly church. That's exactly right, right. Yeah. Um, which I also really appreciated growing yeah. up in a Christian family and mm-hmm. thinking you can say all the all the right things and they don't sound right or feel right in mm-hmm. real life. And yeah. so they take some of those things and rework them and help us understand what does this actually mean um, to be in relationships with others, to give but not to the point of being burnt out um, or to want to serve or want to help, but knowing that there are limits to that and that that's right. They're supposed to be. Um, that was really great for me as a 17-year-old, and now it is for me as an adult as well. So Sure. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. That's the first book. Kristen's um, only 18 now, too. It's only a year <laughs> later. Right? She's an adult. Most people do ask if I'm 18. I tell them I'm graduating, and they're like, oh, from high school? From what? Like, no. <laughs> oh, no, no. I'll get my PhD in just a few months. But um, anyways, apart from You could be 18 age... and get your PhD. Why not? She's yeah. an overachiever. All right. <laughs> There was a second book that you ref- we're going to reference right. to. Okay? That's right. The second book um, I discovered once I was in graduate school, and it's entitled Attachment in Psychotherapy, mm-hmm. and it's by Dr. David Wallen. Um, it's a phenomenal book on attachment in psychotherapy. Um, and again, I think he does well what Drs. John Cloud and Henry Townsend, or the opposite of their names, do John, really well. Uh, Henry, Henry, Henry Cloud, Cloud and John, John Townsend. Townsend. There right, we yeah. go. <laughs> um, they they make, won't know. They'll never hear this anyway. Don't worry. <laughs> they make um, some concepts that we talk about as therapists all the time um, really understandable for a lay audience. And I read the book when I was a second year in graduate school and was just beginning to take some courses and still didn't really know what I was doing or what attachment was or any of those things. And he broke down the concepts um, and he writes actually for both the therapist and also for the client, which means that it's not just um, in clinical ease, but something that you can really understand Sure, and helps you understand the relationship. Um, it's not all academic. That's right. Right. That's right. That's a lot of dry stuff you got to go through exactly. and exactly. read through in a PhD program. <laughs> exactly. So. so that was a book um, that I read in my very first practicum site cool. during our um, book group. And I've 
learned so much and actually I'm using it for my dissertation as well. So oh, very it's good. Have a long so you just you impact. just keep it by your bedside. You know, every it, day it for actually the last kind of years. is. Don't laugh at me. I'm kind of a nerd, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm just laughing at the you know if at yeah. the story. I don't empathy, know. empathy. That's, that's, yeah, okay, sure. that's right. Yes. Uh, cool. Uh, is there a particular work of art, film, painting? Yeah. Film literature television that uh that really that you really appreciate and to yeah, highlight for us there is um this is a classic it's les mis ah. uh, <laughs> by ah. victor hugo uh-huh. um and it is a literature uh, work of art both obviously in book form i'm actually still reading the 1400 page version that i started before graduate school because i told you i was gonna say you have a lot of time stuff. in graduate school to be reading <laughs> les mis on exactly. the side my i gosh. read 58 pages at a time oh every my few gosh months. Um, <laughs> but the book itself is phenomenal. Um, uh-huh. It has some really important themes that have been transformative for me. Themes sure. of redemption, themes of grace and mercy and having a second chance. Um, all themes that I think are really relevant, actually, for the work that we do as therapists and for how I see myself as a clinician. Nice. Um, and I also love the movie as well. And that is not to be confused with the newest movie that just came out, uh, the musical of Les Mis. Um, well, There's so you're a, talking about there was the Anne Hathaway and... Yeah, uh, no, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. No. There's another movie. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> with Wait, Liam so you Neeson. liked that one, or you didn't like that I one? Didn't, I don't like the new one, actually, okay. so gotcha. I'm sorry to everyone who does. Um, but I really <laughs> <Disclaimer>. like... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I really like um, the movie that's with Liam Neeson. He actually plays the role of Jean Valjean, uh-huh. the main character, yeah. and does a phenomenal job. He's Whoa. actually... That movie is why he's my favorite actor. Um, oh, but anyways, okay. let's forget they, they were able to make him look young at the beginning? I mean, he looks young, young he's strong, he's great. Okay, I mean, all, right. all the things you love about him yeah, in the new movie. He's an plays, aging guy, so <laughs> I see. Even okay. better in that movie. I have to say, uh, I'm not a mu- big musical person, and so I've never seen it on stage. Yeah. The first, My first exposure to Les Mis was actually watching the Anne Hathaway oh, really? uh, version. Yeah, and, did you uh, like it? Hugh yeah. Jackman, right. Yep. Uh, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, but uh, <laughs> the, the Russell Crowe's uh, rendition mm-hmm. of Stars, that actually, I really like, uh, that song, nice. for whatever reason, just resonated yes. with me. I really like how he sang it. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of Les Mis purists, just like, <laughs> Russell Crowe, why is he singing this? He's, you know, just absolute garbage. And fair enough. All I know is, I don't know, that song, just like, oh. Yeah, yeah. That, that song hit me I, somewhere special. I think so. they do a beautiful job with the songs. Mm-hmm. And I just... I don't know. I, I r- wish they were doing like a different classic movie or like book. But anyways, um, it's beautiful just for the music itself. Fair and enough. I would recommend a different movie if you wanted to actually know the story of <laughs> okay. this. <laughs> or a different movie. Want to hear Russell Crowe's uh, singing talent. There we go. I don't know if there is another one. But. Um, and a, is there a personal experience or event in your life that you'd be willing to share that kind of just left a really deep positive impact or taught you a valuable life lesson? Sure. Um, There are so many, but I think the one I've been thinking about the most, um, probably because I'm getting ready to move across the country again and thinking about transitions, was actually my move from the inner city of Detroit, where I grew up as a kid, um, to the suburbs of Detroit uh, when I was 15. And I think that- Can't imagine that was dramatic. No, no, not at all. It was totally normal, (laughs) really chill. Um, No. (laughs) Um, Moving out of the city when I was at the end of middle school, into high school, and into the suburbs was- just really transformative because it really opened my eyes to the gaps that exist in socioeconomic status between people. Culture Um, shock. Yeah. At a number of levels. It did on a number of levels. And I think as a high school student, this is so random, but the biggest thing that stood out to me was the difference in the libraries that we had access to. Hmm. You're picking up a theme that I love books. And that's mm-hmm. the type of like art or literature that's thing cool. that I'm so drawn to. you were paying to. attention to libraries, I see. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I was. Um, but I remember moving from the city where there were super old, beautiful libraries, but inside everything was just so old like there was no digital system of anything um and computers did exist back then obviously it wasn't that long ago i'm not that old but um 18 we (laughs) specified already (laughs) exactly (laughs) um but it just everything was just old and inaccessible and moving to the suburbs i moved to a suburb where um a new library had just been built it was a multi-million dollar Mm -hmm. incredible building um actually in a suburb where teens would come after school to hang out at the library for fun just and like, it was nice and clean yeah, and new no, exactly. and shiny. They actually had a teen center. Um, wow. They're like, you know, a great cafe downstairs. And I remember just being blown away that this is what the suburbs, at least some of them have to offer, mm-hmm. a 
are resources that are free and accessible, regardless of how much money your parents make yeah. or what your prospects are individually, huh. that the neighborhood that you live in has um, resources to give you access to, regardless of your socioeconomic status. And had no concept of that prior. You only knew what you knew. Exactly. Right. And, and like, I knew that beautiful, wonderful things existed. Um, and I'd seen <laughs> them. I went to visit. Like, I wasn't this super under-resourced kid. Sure. But it was never right in my backyard. For sure. We had to drive. Yeah. My parents had to be intentional, and they were. But I being remember... Being a tourist in the suburb versus actually <laughs> exactly. being a resident of the suburb. Exactly. Yeah. I was going to visit friends. Different worldview. It was. It huh. was. And so when I moved, I just remember thinking thinking like, wow, my parents aren't making that much money, but because we live in this area, mm. I'm able to access things I wouldn't have known about. Wow. Um, not just in the books that are in the library, obviously, but the sure. librarians and what they know, the other people who come to work here, the professionals who come to, um, I don't know, do different things that they do. I just was exposed to other things um, sure. in my neighborhood. I had lots of great exposure with family and church and friends and that stuff, but not in my neighborhood. So I think that was a transformative experience and has also solidified my desire to actually work in urban environments. That's why I'm choosing to move out to Chicago gotcha. and have only applied to interships, uh, internships Excuse me, um, in major metropolitan major areas because I know areas, about yes. the lack of resources um, that are often available. Yeah, for so, sure. Part yeah. of the internship will be revamping the local library. <laughs> you know, well. you know exactly <laughs> my volunteer time. <laughs> <laughs> Which you're also trained to do when you're studying psychology of course, at of a course. doctoral <laughs> level, of course. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, a follow-up question to that, which I think will uh, move us towards some of the other things we want to talk about today, mm -hmm. but uh, can you talk about the transition sort of ethnically from yeah. uh, urban Detroit, yes. if you will, to suburban yes. Detroit? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I recently learned that Detroit has, I think, the highest um, percentage of African Americans in any city in really? America, any major city. Percentage-wise. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. So um, at least... In the most recent census, we'll see what's happening with gentrification recently. Yep. Um, but we were over 80% of the population of the city itself, which really? is a really big deal. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I just was surrounded by diversity in general, but also by people of my own ethnic group, right. which is not something I was used to in other spaces. So again, You don't I, call it diversity <laughs> when you're the majority. You're right. right. You're right. <laughs> exactly. Um, what's interesting about my experience is because I was actually home educated and mm. back in the 90s, especially in early 2000s, being home educated wasn't a, a black uh, thing. And it still kind of isn't. Mm. Um, a lot of ethnic minorities at the time weren't homeschooling their kids. So my experience of education was very white, but my experience of home in my neighborhood was black. Um, and then other ethnic groups though around us as well. So sure. I think moving to the suburbs was a definitely stark <laughs> realization mm. <laughs> of being a minority in my neighborhood again, in a very changed. different way. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think, I don't know, I could say a lot of things about it, but I think just moving, one, which just made me really aware of the, yeah, of the differences that were around me that were more obvious, yep. and then got a lot of wheels turning about what difference do these differences between us make? What do I want to do about them? Um, what does it look like for me to be the only African-American high schooler on this block? Um, really? Do when people see me, what do yep. they think? If I'm doing well, obviously, that represents other African-American teenagers well. If right. I'm not, what does that mean? Mm. Um all those kinds of things are questions that I remember being aware of as sure. I was moving into the suburbs and I'm still aware of now when I go back home. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, and then now having lived in Southern California for mm -hmm. a number of years, yeah, six, yeah, uh, that, that shapes things a little bit differently too. I can it imagine. Does. Yeah. 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 I think now, obviously LA is just a super diverse place mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And so I've had even more exposure just, again, using the backyard analogy in my backyard, right. in my neighborhood to yes. people from all walks of life, for which sure. I have loved. Um, again, back to my journey for um, clinical internship, yeah. I've decided I really want to remain surrounded by people who are from all walks of life, which is why uh, major cities are really attractive to me. Sure. For that reason. A little bit so, of everything. Huh? You know. You yeah. Know, yeah. <laughs> Well, we wanted to talk a little bit too, kind of on that topic, right, mm -hmm. is um, within, I guess, our respective communities, yeah. um, what our experiences have been or perceptions are of some of the barriers yeah. for people of similar backgrounds to us mm -hmm. seeking services mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, because psychotherapy, you know, has its origins, you could say, in both 
kind of research and behaviorism, but also with psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. Freud, the Western world, yes. and, uh, in particular, Freud's of Jewish descent. Mm -hmm. And so that arc, I think, continues in, uh, in, in many circles and in many ways into the practice and the world of psychotherapy today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, there's, um, and, and we'll get to some, st some statistics in a second, you know, nowadays there are people who are providing mental health services, therapy or otherwise, mm -hmm. who look different. That's right. Who we look can. like me or you. <laughs> or, right. right. Yeah. So you've worked in some diverse settings to I date have. already. You've had some experiences yeah. as a, do we say black or do we say African-American? That's a great question. Right. That's um, always a, a I'm okay question. with using both uh -huh. right now. I typically yes. will refer to myself as African-American if uh -huh. I'm speaking to people I don't know. Right. Um, but I feel comfortable personally with using the term black yeah. most of the time. <laughs> sure. So if you've worked with other black or African-American mm -hmm. clients before, mm -hmm. there's a match. There's an understanding perhaps at some level Level, right. Uh, when you're working together with someone who has a similar appearance, at the very least, right, right. Uh, in, in a therapy context. But mm -hmm. what if, what if, what if you don't? Yeah. So yeah. by and large, the majority of my experience is working with people who are not ethnically mm -hmm. matched with me. Yeah. Um, I think that's in keeping with people who come in for psychotherapy. Period. And mm -hmm. then also with being in Southern California because it's yeah. so diverse. Um, yeah, I guess I wonder if you can repeat your question a little bit of some of the was challenges. Was there a question or? in there? I think I was just rambling. <laughs> Thank you no for problem. calling on that. Yeah, I guess uh, maybe just something to think about is sort of, in your own words, how do you see some of the unique, perhaps, challenges or barriers in the African-American community to seeking out mental health services yeah, or psychotherapy? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. I think this is a, a general challenge that is very acute, I think, in the African-American community, and that is the stigma about what it means to mm. enter psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. Everyone has their own ideas and conceptions, um, but I think a stigma that I'm particularly aware of is that um, therapy is only for crazy people, mm. and crazy is reserved. Which is all of us. Of, I so mean, they're I would say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of other people wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So they think it's only for people um, who have extreme, more severe yeah, types of things, yeah. disorder of some mm -hmm. kind that um, really freaks them out. Mm -hmm. And of course, people don't want to associate with something that's scary or that's unknown or uncertain. For sure. And so, um, if therapy is for crazy people, why would I go to therapy? Sure. Um, yeah, and I think something I've been thinking about a lot, and we've talked about it some as well, is the difference that it makes to have exposure to people in that profession yeah. who normalize the experience or say you don't have to be crazy to be in therapy or if you are struggling with something more severe. I don't like the term crazy, but if you are sure. struggling with something more severe, um, that doesn't mean that you're an awful person or that there isn't help or resources available for you. So, so there's a different type or level of stigma that you p uh, perceive or find yeah. specifically in the African-American yeah. community. Yeah, yeah, I do. I think, um, again, back to that exposure thing, there aren't yeah. that many black psychologists, mm -hmm. period, or black psychotherapists uh, who are working um, without being a psychologist necessarily with a master's level or licensed in some other just way. Just in there the just field in general. Yeah, exactly. We don't exist um, as as much as other people do, I think, in terms of representation. Yeah. Um, and I think another thing, and this is a tricky thing to talk about, but is the role of spirituality and faith in the African-American tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and I think oh, I have so much to say about it because I, I am a, I am a believer. I believe in Jesus and I believe that faith is incredibly important. Um, I also think faith has the opportunity to work side by side or even through the work of mental health um, care. Yep. And so I think a lot of times for African-American communities, especially if you are um, strongly religious or have a really strong faith, then often there's a conversation in those communities, in my communities, about praying or about fasting or about finding a spiritual way to solve a challenge that is at least in part, I believe, psychological or a mental health challenge. And so sure. I think those are those are significant things that uh, hinder or are barriers for African-Americans in particular coming you're in. You're saying if there is not a artful or sensitive integration of those components yes. into a, a therapist approach. Yes. That yes. can be uh, a turnoff or just kind of miss real key things or key assets right. of someone's faith and That's right. mental health. That's right. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so and some interesting statistics that we looked at together. The, um this is from an APA report of the American Psychological Association. Between 2005 and 2014, this is just two years ago, uh, uh, you know, there are more people 
just numerically receiving their doctoral degrees in psychology. There's an 18, but this is a gender piece first, which is interesting. There's there was an 18 percent increase in women hmm. uh, receiving doctoral d- doctoral degrees, wow. PhDs and PsyDs. One percent increase in men. Oh. So, and that's I suppose not a new trend. That there's a more sure. and more uh, female heavy field, but uh, I guess that trend's continued in the last uh, 10 years or so. Hmm. Now, across uh, race and ethnicity, I thought that was interesting. Is 36 percent. Um, increase in people identifying as Latino or Hispanic hmm. who are receiving their doctoral degrees, new doctoral oh, recipients awesome. yeah. from 2005 to 2014. So that's 33%, <laughs> about a third jump. For Asians, people <laughs> identified as Asian, Asian Americans, a 46% wow. increase. Go you guys. <laughs> I guess. Although uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I, stand, I, I stand out even less. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm less and less special, I guess. Oh my gosh. In the African American community, uh, 12% increase. Hmm. Yeah. Much lower. Yeah. Uh, what do you think that might be about? Because it sounds like there's there's a need, there should be an interest, there there's an interest for, for people like you. There definitely um, is. But across the board, there's uh, there's an increase, yeah. but it's not at the same level not at as, all. as not at other all. Uh, ethnic I groups. I think those numbers speak a lot, and I feel like parsing apart what they mean is yeah. difficult. Um, but I think one thing probably is if we had the numbers for the number of African Americans who are going into other mental health professionals or other fields, so licensed clinical social workers, marriage and family therapists, other sure. licensed therapists, yeah. I imagine that number is increasing significantly. Okay. But right. we talked about this at the beginning of the show, that yeah. getting a doctor is a lot of work. For sure. Um, but I think Back to something I said earlier about socioeconomic status, it's also a very expensive degree. And I remember after getting accepted to multiple doctoral programs, sitting there and thinking to myself, can I afford this? Right. There's literally no one to support me in doing this. When I fill out financial aid every year, there's no one I say is sending me any money, period. And that has nothing to do with the level of emotional um, or relational support that I'm getting, but the level of practical financial resources yeah. and that definitely um, is not something I have access to and I think that is the story of many African Americans as well. I think there are so many people in the African American community with a huge heart yeah. who are well educated in terms of having a bachelor's degree and want to do something um, and the fastest thing that they can do is to get a master's degree um, and that's and that's the fastest, not just in terms of how long you're in school, but how Amount quickly you can actually start implementing right. the the work and the service that you want to be able to offer. Sure. And, um, Which is already an investment. Yeah. If it's a two or three that, year degree. Oh, my gosh. That's versus, amazing. For a doctor degree, it can be five, six, seven years. You know, or exactly. More. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so. Sure. So. Uh, well, we'd, we'd love to see those numbers change we at would. some point. Of course. Yes. Still, uh, my understanding based on that APA report. 75% people identifying as Caucasian, hmm. uh, new doctoral degrees as of yeah. 2014. Yeah. Um, which is not a knock against our white and Caucasian not friends. Not at all. We just love just you saying guys. we're it's meeting great. the demands <laughs> of our society, of our country, right? Hmm. And uh, that's one of the things that you were starting with, right, is uh, the value of a match or yeah. congruence or yeah. feeling of being understood. Yep. Now, uh, so, so one of the things you were saying is that you know who who where do where do young people in the african american community look to for the face of yeah. mental health That's or right. psychology or mm-hmm. professionals right and uh, you know there are some great people that both you and i know yep, who we who, do. who are african american and are psychologists and are fantastic mm-hmm. but you know how big of a face are they right. at large right exactly you know? Uh, and I have to think, you know, at the very least, sort of from a branding perspective, right? I mean, <laughs> yes. you know, to have a black president or yeah. a female president, right. I mean, right. um, that's now something that we can imagine. Yeah. It's real. Exactly. Right? Um, exactly. It's, uh, you know, and to have a Chinese American player in the NBA, right? that's something we can, I mean, that was the most <laughs> exciting right. thing. This is such a, I could talk for hours on that. But I mean, you know, it's like probably for a young African American boy, hmm. it's not at all a stretch to, picture being mm-hmm. a professional athlete and mm-hmm. all that comes with that and that mm-hmm. excitement but for someone like me right Wasn't before even an option. right i mean we have lots of we could picture ourselves being engineers yeah <laughs> yep physicians we could do that easily which is nothing, nothing nothing wrong with that too right um but you know a lot of us played sports too and it's like we couldn't picture right. ourselves you know, carving up the Lakers and scoring 37 <laughs> points yeah. when the Lakers were still good. I course, mean, but <laughs> back then. So yeah. Jeremy Lin going off a few years ago, that was like the biggest deal. So mm, yeah. anyways, um, 
Right. So in a sense, right, you and I representing our field to our community. We do. We do. And I I think something that stands out to me is I think about that. Um, You mentioned having a black president and I think about the impact that Barack Obama has had. Um, And obviously, I don't think it's actually quantifiable and it won't be for quite a long time Mm -hmm. um, for us to figure out how much of a difference it's made just to see someone who's an ethnic minority, period, to start with that. And then as an African-American second and then an African-American male, um, those just, I think the ramifications are huge. But I think something that that his role as the president of the United States doesn't do is make the possibility of being president more Any pressing. more easy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And so I think about well, now I can imagine, mm-hmm. but it still feels like a yeah. dream. Is that it's a not reality? something that can happen in real life. And I think that's the difference between having someone um, phenomenal in a position of incredible sure. power and influence, but that's a distant position. It's far away than having someone you know, someone who's local in your actual community that you can see, oh, I really could be whatever profession it is, because I know those people. Hey, That's imagine that. a little bit more within exactly. the realm of uh, possibility. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Me or my son ever playing in the NBA. Yeah, I don't know. That's <laughs> <laughs> just because of Jeremy Lin. Uh, I don't know. No <laughs> I mean, offense, Jeremy. He can believe. He can That's believe. Right. Here's right. <laughs> Keep the faith, right? <laughs> That's right. I see. Um, so uh, another, there's an article that you and I read together uh, called, if this is published in, this is a, number, a while ago, 2003, mm-hmm. in a journal called Professional Psychology Research and Practice, an article by Cardamil and Battle, two psychologists. It's called Guess Who's Coming to Therapy? <laughs> Getting Comfortable with Conversations About Race and Ethnicity in Psychotherapy. I'm assuming that's a reference to Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. That's right. The classic film Mm -hmm. originally with Bernie Mac and Ashton (laughs) Kutcher. No, sorry. (laughs) Not originally. (laughs) That's not the reason. I'm joking. That's right. Sidney Poitier in the 60s, right? right. I have to think that was way ahead of its time. (laughs) Yeah, it really was. Yeah. I loved watching that movie as a kid. That's right. Speaking of films that have been remade sometimes better than other times, right? Yeah. Um, So one of the things that they talk about in this article, Cardamill and Battle, is how to approach race and ethnicity in the therapy room. Mm -hmm. Now, they specifically say in their article that they're, for simplicity's sake, gearing their recommendations to Caucasian therapists. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they talk about is that for so many reasons, ethnicity and race, if you're working with someone who is not white as a client, who is black or Latino or Asian American or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. that if you ignore that component of who they are, you can really be missing important yeah, pieces very true. of treating them, mm-hmm. if you will, in the mm-hmm. therapy relationship. You may even be doing harm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I appreciate that. I think that I like that they're sensitive to that and that they're trying to promote sensitivity right. Right. to that. Um, but I'd be curious to talk about that with you, Kristen, um, as a non-white <laughs> therapist. Yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts, both as someone in the field mm-hmm. and as someone who hopes for you know access and promotion of yeah. what we do to people from a similar background? Yeah, I think... Um... Well, I wonder if you can simplify the question one more time, and I'll directly... <laughs> Gosh, I'm just Sorry. Getting, rambling off again. Um, do, do you... Well, let me ask it this way. Okay. Uh, do you think that there's benefit for therapists in being trained in diversity and approaching ethnic diversity in the therapy room? Oh, my gosh. The answer is most definitely mm-hmm. yes. And it's not because um, that's a PC thing to say. Mm-hmm. Everyone's like, oh, diversity training. Mm. That phrase actually really annoys me. I think it's overused and it's yeah. now just very cliche and doesn't mean anything mm-hmm. substantial. And um, I'd vote for a different phrase. I just don't know what I phrase I would promote but to just stamp um, <laughs> diversity on it that means we've covered our bases oh my gosh sensitive yeah to people yeah. who are it, different and no it just makes me feel like we've um filled the quota or we can check off the box and that's not what we're looking for at all yep. um so I think diversity training is huge um I think about the diversity class that I took in my graduate training and how formative it was um especially the way the class was set up it wasn't just a lecture style class but we also had a seminar portion yep. where we broke up into small groups that were intentionally ethnically diverse and the challenges that came with that the real conversations the tears that welled up in people's eyes and in contrast the distance the disengagement of some students who felt like they didn't want to talk about this they didn't feel the need to talk about it Hmm. and i'm looking at your face martin and thinking about the shock or like wait why someone doesn't think it's important um well in some ways it doesn't surprise me it's it's more it more pains me yeah Uh, well i guess it surprised me a little bit because 
that's not how I think about it. Totally. But, but exactly. It no, shouldn't surprise me. Put no, it that way. that's similar to my experience. I remember yeah. being in the room and thinking, this is this isn't like a a topic of secondary importance. Like, sure. oh, like you're gonna learn interventions and you're gonna learn about um how to theories. work with African Americans. Right. How to work with Latino <laughs> exactly. Americans. That's just it's a class, it's a separate thing. Yeah, that's no. Right. This isn't I guess the best word is that this isn't an elective. This isn't something that you get to decide, do I wanna think about this or not? This is essential. Mm-hmm. Um and I remember actually a student in the class, someone who I love and think is amazing. But I remember this student saying, well, if I have to choose between all these different types of diversities of diversities of human diversity, what to focus on, I'd rather focus on this thing or this group of minorities rather than this one, because it's too overwhelming to think about all of the different things I need to focus on. And on the one hand, while I completely empathize, like they're so overwhelming. I don't know that much about Native American psychology or, you know, um, working with those who are immigrants from Guatemala who are second generation. Like there's lots of specificity and, and nuance and, you know, details that can be overwhelming. Um, at the same time, I don't think we ought to have the privilege to decide, well, I'm just going to focus on this because that will make learning about diversity easy for me Hmm. or more manageable. I think it's okay if you say, I'm going to start here and I will try and become competent and learn more and dig deeper. And then I can't, I can't stay there. I have to learn about other people and other things because that's the world that we live in. And just like you were saying earlier, by me not learning about something or at least focusing on it from a time for a time um i'm bound to miss something even with my clients who might identify as the same race as me um they don't all have the same background and their exposure and experiences are different so yeah some other african-american female growing up in detroit can have a completely oh different gosh. experience completely. of race of, I- yes. of identity yes. of Definitely. socioeconomics of everything You're just right. cuz they're they raised totally in a different do. household I, or what have you. Yeah, but. or even the same household. I have two <laughs> sisters and we have very different experiences <laughs> like, of a lot you, of things. What are you talking about, Krista? <laughs> Jeez. You're right. What's a big deal? Calm down. <laughs> well, so one of the, this you and I read this together. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's in this article, they talk about they kind of have some sample scripts mm-hmm. for therapists to uh, which I think are very well intended to help people have some ways of bringing up ethnicity. Yeah. Because if I'm a white therapist talking to someone who is Native American or what mm-hmm. have you, and I want to be sensitive to that and right. and uh, have that be part of the conversation mm-hmm. as appropriate, mm-hmm. how am I going to do that in a sensitive way? And so here, here's an example. Uh, they say one way to open this type of conversation might be as follows. I know that this can sometimes be a difficult topic to discuss, but I was wondering how you feel about working with someone who is from a different racial or ethnic background. I asked because although it is certainly my goal to be as helpful to you as I possibly can, I also know that there may be times when I cannot fully appreciate your experiences. I want you to know that I am always open to talking about these topics whenever they are relevant. So that sounds good and appropriate. And if someone were to say that, um, I, I would probably sense and hope that they're coming from a good place. But I can't imagine myself saying that. Hmm. It feels very awkward to me. Yeah. Tell me... <laughs> Here's a therapist question. Tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. How does <laughs> that make What makes me feel? it feel awkward? Um, I'm not. Sh- I, I'm not quite sure, but um, I think the best that I can think about it is, and I want to get your thoughts too. Is I think there's two things that color my response to that, mm-hmm. which is again, uh, well, three things. One is knowing that they're tailoring some of these recommendations to Caucasian therapists. Yeah, totally. Uh, a second piece is I'm Chinese American. I sort of feel like. And this may be a blind spot or not, that do do I need to introduce race hmm. as a topic here? Whether hmm. the person across from me is Asian American or not. Right. They might be Caucasian American and right. very often are. And right. I'm Asian American. Is I'm happy to talk about it. Totally. But it, is, it, is it my place to bring mm-hmm. it up? If it comes up, great. Hmm. But uh, it sort of feels like, well, race is already in the room. You're right. Now, right. that I completely agree with you yeah. on. It's already in the room, but maybe this is because I've been reading a whole bunch of psychoanalytic research to, mm-hmm. recently, but yeah. thinking about the things that are implicit and making them explicit, the things yeah. that are subconscious or unconscious and making it conscious, I think that's the value of at least attempting to make something um, nonverbal and obvious verbal in the room Absolutely, by saying something yeah. about it. Question how to do it and you know when to do it. That's a great question. Or yes. who should do it? Um, sure. I, I am biased to think that if I observe something as a therapist in the room, I am aware that I still have more power 
and more privilege in the room because I am the trained specialist. In the role of, uh, exactly. uh, role of authority. And, and yeah. even though as an ethnic minority and as a female, I don't help hold privilege with a good number of my clients um, in terms of hmm. gender or in terms of race, yeah. I do hold a place, a place of privilege, excuse me, um, in the room as the therapist. And I take that seriously. Sure. Um, and so I think, and this is part of my, my theoretical orientation is being intentional about taking the one down position sometimes, mm-hmm. or if I don't say the one down position, then, um, yeah, then, then acknowledging the privilege that's there if, if it's in terms of power or just in terms of letting them know that this is an awkward topic. And whenever something's awkward, I want them to know it's okay. It's For the sure. same stance I take about sex or swearing sure when people come in especially if i'm at a clinic associated with a christian name or something like i don't know if i can talk about this or, i've had so you many clients can't talk I'm, about sex you know oh my clinic. never or, I, I apologize for swearing and i look at them a little strange like why are you apologizing this is your space god is listening in a therapy room and <laughs> wagging his finger that's exactly right. well, with disapproval is, right now i'm not wagging my finger so <laughs> please be honest that's right um so i think similarly helping someone know that the thing that's awkward or unacceptable in other spaces is it's not something that I feel uncomfortable with discussing. That's what I, I want fair to make clear. Yeah, no. And I can get behind that. And again, I'm not saying that uh, ethnic differences in the therapy room shouldn't be talked about oh, no. and should be sensitive to. You're yeah, right. no. But, uh, you know, so the other piece is I'm obviously shaped by having grown up, uh, lived most of my life and practicing in Los Angeles. Yeah. Which, as you said before, we've got everything here. You really do. And <laughs> for the most part, I mean, obviously, there's enclaves of a little bit of everything everywhere. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're a total melting pot here. Hmm. Um, and I don't take that. I try not to take that for granted. Right. But I have to think, you know, if you're writing uh, an article that's, you know, going to appeal to a whole field. Right. And, you know, I know that I'm in a certain context right. and, and that's not representative of most of the rest of this country and right. most contexts <laughs> in which other psychologists are going to be yes. practicing. Yes. And uh, I also don't represent 75% of no. people who are getting degrees in That's psychology. Right. That's right. Um, so I'm glad that there's articles like this and people out here out, out there who are giving guidelines. Right. Um, I, I think maybe my response to it was just sort of, well, uh, I, I don't feel like I need such a... Mm. a that kind of script. Yeah. I feel like it's going to come yeah. up naturally. And, and, and they do a good job of saying that. But I just thought that was no, interesting to point. imagine myself yeah. putting it that way. Yeah. So I, I don't know if, if you felt similarly or not. Uh, yeah, I think I read the article the first time a couple of years ago, and mm-hmm. I, I thought it was a really good idea. The thing I remember, I was a second year graduate student when I first read the article, and I was just freaked out, actually, of like mm. bringing up something like that. It really did feel awkward to me. So I think now that I've had hundreds and thousands of more conversations yes. in the clinical context than I did a few years ago. Yes. Um, I think the awkwardness of it doesn't feel as awkward to me. And I think the value of bringing it up has become more significant. I have one example in mind actually Please. that stands out. Um, I think about work that I did with a man of Latin American descent. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember being aware that I am significantly younger than this person and by several decades. <laughs> and I am also <laughs> a female mm-hmm. and I am also african-american and so we have lots of things that are very different between us and we had months of sessions and it never came up never once did we talk about those differences and i remember getting to a point in our work thinking i don't know this is going to quote unquote naturally come up so i want to raise the question what's it like for any of these differences between us working with a therapist who's younger than you are working with a therapist who's african-american you've mentored african-americans you work with but it's not the same thing, especially when we get back to power or privilege with me being the therapist. You're coming here because you need some help Mm -hmm. and you know that. And I know that. And how do we talk about the way that our differences might be manifesting themselves in their room in ways that maybe we both agree? Well, thankfully they're, they're not, they're not a problem at all. Or I've had other clinical contexts where I've had clients say, yeah, I feel like I need to use PC language in here because I'm having a problem with this ethnic group and without using the same without using so many words, they went up telling me like, well, you're an ethnic minority. And so I don't want to use the derogatory term I have in my mind because I don't want to offend you. Mm -hmm. I'm like, but Mm -hmm. even if I'm not using it about you. Exactly. Exactly. And and while I respect Mm -hmm. and greatly appreciate it, I I mean, derogatory (laughs) words I'm not about, but a part of therapy is you being honest and you being authentic. And so if you have all of these Mm, super angry comments to say about this people group and you're not talking about it in here, then half of what we're supposed to be doing, we're not even addressing. And so I need to let you know that even though you're afraid of offending me, 
I want you to be honest and we can talk about it. if you do offend me what does it look like for me to be offended mm, does that mean yes. our relationship is over forever right. what do we do with that sure and so um, the that, dividing lines between race can be a context for working in the transference if you will there we go right there we that's, go that's, that's right. exactly cool so, Another thing that came up for me that was interesting, and then I want to hear a little bit more experiences if we have time, uh, was just thinking about if it comes up, it comes up. I'm, I'm all for that. But I but I also just think there's a lot of context. And if someone's coming in and they're maybe not in crisis, like they're a danger to themselves or somebody else, but yes. really suffering. Yeah. They are really deep in depression yeah. or they are dealing with really acute panic disorder. Yeah. Maybe they're a couple that like we are just at each other's throats yep. and a marriage is on the brink. Yeah. It, it sort of, to me, feels like, is this the time to be bringing up race, sure. even if they're, you know, one of them is Indian and the other one is, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. It's like, right. I, I think that right. there's a, a time and place. Totally. And totally. Uh, I think also why someone's coming in matters. Right. You know, yeah. if it's I also think maybe there's a piece of if we're working together, me and a client longer term, perhaps totally. on more right general self-exploration, inside mm-hmm. oriented therapy, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. that makes 100 percent more sense to me mm-hmm. than someone saying, you know, I want cognitive behavior therapy for right. OCD. Right. Well, it's not that it won't come up. And it's not to say that's not important, but it's right. kind of not in some ways as mm-hmm. important on my agenda in terms right. of how I'm helping this person. Yeah. So I don't know if that's fair or not. Yeah. I think I'm glad that you acknowledge like the different um, theoretical orientation or types of interventions you might be doing, because I think if someone's coming in for a behavioral intervention about or for a panic or OCD or something like that. Um, it does make a big difference how acute the situation is. And most of the work I've done has been depth work. And I think the shortest, I don't know, series of sessions I've ever had is like four or five months. And mm-hmm. usually it's a couple of years and, and longer term. And so I am, I'm yep. coming from that context. For sure. Um, you have the, the luxury as well as it makes, it makes sense it in does. that kind of work it does. to talk about all aspects of totally, the relationship. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think... I think your question about timing is huge. I don't know when things should always be brought up. I think if I was always doing a structured interview, I would recommend when I talk about um, asking the client how they self-identify, um, doing a, even if it's a brief like history of their childhood and growing up experiences, I would want to talk about, I would just want to yep. bring up the differences between us that are obvious in the room. Um, so identify as male, what's that like for you? What does that mean? And identify as female. Like, I just want to bring it up and mm-hmm. say, well, if you have any thoughts, what it's like to work with a female we'll just therapist. Just name it. Maybe you know, it's nothing. I just but want you to we'll know just, you can. Yep. Um, similarly, I feel that way about race. Um, in general, though, I actually don't work with structured interview processes. So I do take a far more client-centered approach that is far more non-directive. Mm-hmm. And so um, I hope I hope and wait for things to come up, quote unquote, organically. But just like I was mentioning with the two different clients a couple of minutes ago, that when something hasn't come up and I'm beginning to feel like I think this is this is impactful and I don't know why yeah. I start to question myself and I don't just interpret or conceptualize as for whatever reason, they're not bringing it up because yeah. they have a transference issue using <laughs> psychoanalytic language. That's right. But to say bust through that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Fast. Um, but it's for me to say, well, where, where is it incumbent upon me to make sure I bring this up? Yeah. And I usually bring it up in a curious tone of, I'm not sure if this feels important to you, but I wanted to just check in. And say, I've, I've noticed you seem hesitant to use this language, or when we talk about culture, yeah. you speak in this way. Or I noticed we haven't talked about this at all. We've been working mm-hmm. together for 18 months. So sure. <laughs> does this have any relevance that makes sense. for you? I can get behind that. <laughs> Are there other specific experiences that you'd be willing to share sort of when race has been in the room for you as a therapist or uh, as in a, supervision yeah. as a therapist in training? Perhaps? Yeah, that's a great question. I think... I'm pretty sure I've brought up race or it's come up in every type of supervision I've ever had. I was counting back and realized I've had 10 direct uh, wow. supervisors over the course of the last six years. And by and large, they've all been white. Um, I've had one African-American female supervisor. And I think that probably was, for multiple reasons, one of the most formative training experiences I've ever had. Hmm. Um, one of them, though, is because I felt like I could be more of myself with her in a way that I had never experienced before. And um, moment of self-disclosure, at the end of our work together, I actually burst into tears. (laughs) And there are a lot of reasons I burst into tears. And my supervisor knew that. She was really quiet. And then she asked, well, 
you think there are other things going on that are prompting you to cry? Not just the fact that Processing we're Processing a relationship here. How about <laughs> yes, that? Yes, <laughs> we were. But I was able to be honest with her and say there are some things about, one, your personality, but it's also true, as I've been reflecting too, about her being a black woman that allows me yeah. to see what it can be like to yep. be a black woman who's a supervisor. And, and who's a psychologist. Oh, totally. A professional. Exactly. And doing what I'm exactly. on the path Exactly. Yeah, this is real. Exactly. It's yeah. real. Right. And she's an example for me. Yeah. But also, um, this is something about her as well, of course, as a person, but her way of being disarming or her way of being honest modeled for me what it would be like for me to be honest, for me yeah. to be myself in the room. Um it's harder to internalize those things when <laughs> someone doesn't look like no, you. No, it's really true. It just it is. really is. It yeah. really is. And even apart from the personality um, aspects of what made our supervision experience really good, I think as a black woman, something that is a part of black culture, honesty is really important to us. Mm. And honesty yep. is important in a lot of cultures, but explicit, direct honesty. It's less important in Asian culture. I mean, <laughs> you could say it that way. I'm glad you're I'll saying say that. that. You set me up for <laughs> that's that. That's right. right. That's right. I, I you didn't want to say that out loud. Right in front of my mouth. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, I want to say it's less important. It's, uh, <laughs> that's right. It's just different. It's different. That's, <laughs> it's right. really true. And that's so right. I think because that's part of my, yes. it's both my personality, but my personality has been shaped by my ethnic identity. And so I am more direct and more open. So being with a supervisor who was like that, I could be truly more of myself. Right. And I've had other supervisors who are of different ethnicities. And when they've been that way, I've been more of myself as well. I don't think I really actually ever hit that level hmm. of authenticity before. Yeah. Um, and so I do think the match makes a difference. I know there are going to be people who listen to this or hear about our conversation and think I definitely didn't have that experience mm. when I had an ethnic identity match with my supervisor. And right. that's real. Totally. Sure. Totally. So people are still people. That's They're right. still individuals. <laughs> that's, that's right. right. <laughs> that's right. I just think I think the doors were open to something else that could be because there was an ethnic identity match. Um, yeah. So in the supervision process, that's definitely been really meaningful to yeah. me. And I will say, I've also had a Chinese American supervisor, the female as well, mm. and I've also that, felt like that I couldn't could have be... gone well. There's no <laughs> way. <laughs> uh, no. Oh no. <laughs> it actually was really great. Okay. Um, I've loved working with her, and I also felt like I was able to be more of myself, talking about mm. things that were. I would be less likely to bring up things that were challenged for me, questions I had regarding. Um, gender, her yep. being a female, yep. regarding attraction potentially to a client, things mm -hmm. that you're just like, Ugh, do I talk about this sure. in supervision? I should, quote unquote, but do yeah. I feel comfortable? And I did feel comfortable with her, both because she was a woman, but also I got to talk about some of the layers of culture and ethnicity um, right. more directly without having to explain as much, sure. I guess. Even if she comes from a different place, oh, there's uh, at least yes. some baseline right. level of, you kind of get something. That's right. And th yeah. the thing we have in common is being a minority female in yes. America. And that is its own category of similarity by For sure. itself. So. That's right. Yeah. You know, it's funny. And you talk about things that you feel comfortable sharing with one person versus another, whether mm -hmm. in supervision or not. Um, I mean, I think sometimes, see if you relate to this too, it's it's not even conscious. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, no, it's Most of the time it's not. <laughs> right? It's just like, why well, I'm I, I meet someone, another Asian American dude who's about my age. Mm -hmm. It it It's like, I already know this guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? It's really true. We don't, we don't have to start talking. I know... It I, I know where this guy comes from. That's There's so really much less explaining I have to do. And it's not that I'm opposed to doing that for someone who looks different no. or comes from a different place, but no. it's just a different amount of work. And yeah. There's a lot more questions that I don't have answers to yeah. about this person in general. I don't yeah. have a template for understanding yeah. them and how they're going to respond to something right. I say. Right. The the layers of difference and experience are mm -hmm. just that much, that much greater. I, they really right? are. I have a really random story from everyday life yeah. um, that reminds me of that. I went to um, see the LA Philharmonic not long ago. Cool. And um, I always consciously, but mostly subconsciously, observe how many minorities are in these types of <laughs> fine arts environments. It's on your mind. <laughs> and I went with a friend of mine who's a white male. And I, yeah, was just aware, like, well, well, I'm an ethnic minority female, and that's cool. No problem. But while I was there, I passed another black female mm. who was there <laughs> with a white male. And I was like, <gasps> what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I remember thinking, we have something in common. Wait a minute. And I, we actually were both waiting outside of the restroom um, for the people we had gone to the event with to come out of the restroom. And we're just standing there awkwardly, like not talking to each other. And I remember thinking, like, I should say something to her. I'm just glad that we have a similar experience. And so... I thought about it, like we smiled, like 
And I turned around, I was like, this is an awkward moment. But I was like, I want to say something. So I did something really random. And I just walked over to her and said, hi, how are you? And just like introduced myself without even giving my name. And she said, I'm so glad that you are here. Wow. I'm so glad that you came huh. over to say hello. And I'm glad we just are here in this space. And I was like, I feel like I've known you mm. for years. And you are a 70-year-old black woman mm. here with your husband, who's yeah. a white male. Our experiences are, of life are very different. For sure. But in this moment, we share this commonality of being black females here in this space that's not usually full of us. Sure. And we know that. We right. both observe this, even though we're complete strangers. Mm. And I think... That's an example from everyday life where race and ethnicity and gender is and not always conscious. Exactly, yeah. truly, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, whether you're a sexual minority or whatever it is, yeah. like it, it's it's relevant, and sometimes it's more apparent than others. And when you are with someone who shares just some small part of your experience, yeah. how amazing it can be. Um, and I think sometimes wow. in the therapy room it can happen that way too. Um, I do have to give a plug and say I've loved working with people who are not african-american in the therapy room as well and so <laughs> i don't think there has to be an ethnic match Absolutely. for us yeah. to do great work and similarly i've had therapists when i've been the client who have been asian-american african-american and caucasian-american and i've done good work i hope they think so with all of them <laughs> <laughs> you know if i don't um, say so myself i was pretty awesome <laughs> definitely help them you know that's right <laughs> <laughs> and I think good work can be done um, yeah. regardless of that match. So For sure. Well, and maybe a way to say it is good work in therapy can be enhanced even more so yeah. when there's sensitive and appropriate attention to differences that's right. in the room. That's right. And I think that's something that's what came up in each of the contexts that I had when I was the actual client as well, where we were able to talk about our differences or our similarities. And that, yeah, definitely facilitated deeper work, which that's I a really That's like, a really nice story. I'm glad you shared that. Good. I mean, it could have gone in different ways because I, I can relate to that in <laughs> yes. some ways where it's like there's one other Asian person in a room of psychologists like, what are you doing here? <laughs> like on one hand, I really want to talk to you. On the other right. hand, it's kind of like, hey, I'm not the only Asian person in this right? room. It's, it's kind of weird. weird. It it's, is. It's, it's not like I'm necessarily too. competitive, right. but like but this, but a little bit, but, but not yeah. really. And at the same time, like, oh, thank God that person's there. Exactly. Right? <laughs> like, if, I, if I start feeling awkward or anxious, at least there's that person. That's right? exactly right. Know? That's exactly so right. So it's always just like, do I talk to them or no, do I not? True. But I, I find myself being really glad that you did in no. that case. Yeah, I yeah. am. I am too. I've had a similar experience just as a professional as well, attending events and seeing yeah. there's another African-American in the room or there are three of us or four of us. And it's weird mm, because mm-hmm. it's disor- disorienting. It's not normal to go to a conference and find there's actually a handful of us. There's right. usually just me um, or you know, one other person and we're both tokens. And I have noticed though, and I'm not sure if this is special to the African-American community in psychology, but we often do come find each other and say something. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Sure. And how relieved we both feel, um, regardless of the training differences we might have or differences in theoretical orientation. doesn't really matter. We're just like, Oh, I'm glad you're here. Sure. Well, and it's interesting. You can have that camaraderie just built in so quickly, so automatically. Um, and I don't know about you, but I'm always sort of like, well, now we're becoming that Asian clique from <laughs> yeah, high school totally, and everyone else totally. is looking like, oh, they're, they're doing that Asian thing again. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, oh, I, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. are. Yeah. Um, and but I'm conscious about that. Totally. And, and, and I'm a little self-conscious about totally. it. Totally. Yeah. You know? No, me too. So, I do think about that. Like yeah. if I walk into a room and there's another African-American that I don't know, if I quote unquote happen to sit next to them, it's obvious to the rest of the room, all oh, the black people are sitting together. I sure. wonder if they're friends. And if I tell the person, no, I mean, if I tell other people, I don't know them, you know, I'm just, like, well, I'm just here. Like, you oh, don't know the you guys black. look like <laughs> your friends. You're talking and laughing. I'm like, well, Mm. we're not (laughs) right but we're glad we're both here and we have this thing in common that we're grateful to share and i i have a similar experience when i walk into a room um and there's only one other woman or um something like that i think i can't speak for people who are of other minority groups but Mm -hmm. i think there's a similar experience if you walk into a room and you're like oh Someone else from that. Detroit is here. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> because you know that as soon as you walk in the room, right? Yeah, well, the, you know, exactly. The it's Detroit very obvious radar that you're from Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do we have time for one more quick question? Totally. Um, so I was going to ask you, too, is if for you, I mean, you're, we can sort of, you and I can reflect on this from both angles as therapists mm-hmm. from our respective backgrounds, as well as picturing or having uh, what it's like to be a client yeah. in therapy or thinking about our clients in yeah. therapy. Being who you are, coming from where you come from, 
if you were working with a therapist, how important would it be to you that they share, let's just say your ethnic background? Yeah, that's a great question. It's really good because I've thought about it for years. Um, and as we're as we've seen earlier, the the pickings are kind of slim too. Well, very, yeah. very. <laughs> um, I actually will, I guess. Long story short, say that I've had multiple therapists of my mm-hmm. own choosing. I've never been yep. forced to go to therapy. But I remember the very first time I decided to go to therapy. I was, I think, a sophomore in college, and was like, I've heard this is a good idea. I'm switching to the psychology field as a major. You know, maybe I should go to therapy and try it out or something. And <laughs> before I, I decide <laughs> if this is really what I want to do, <laughs> exactly. maybe I should like, try. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going into the counseling center, and you actually got to say if you had any preferences for who you worked with. So mm. gender, ethnicity. I think that was probably it, actually. Um, and <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Those That's are the right. only choices. <laughs> People over six foot five. Yeah, exactly. Pref- prefer not. And I remember saying um, having a gender match was very important to mm. me. So I wanted to work with a female. Okay. I just felt more comfortable. Like I could yep. share more honestly about my experiences. Um, and then I also... Yeah, I think that probably was the most important to me. And then if there was an opportunity to have an ethnic minority, period, Mm. I wrote that. And I think part of why I said that as an 18 or 19-year-old was like, I know there are not going to be very many ethnic minorities. So if I can get (laughs) any ethnic minority, I'd feel grateful. Let me just check that box, see what I get, (laughs) roll the dice. Exactly, Asian, Latino, doesn't matter. Please just give them to me. Um, (laughs) And I remember being matched with a black male therapist Mm. and being shocked. Like first, I didn't know there were black male therapists. (laughs) Second, definitely not at the school I went to because a predominantly white institution. And that experience, again, so many factors going into therapy, for sure. but was so meaningful for me because we wound up talking about themes that wouldn't have come up or I wouldn't have felt as comfortable with, right. um, especially themes related to my experiences of black men when we were able to actually go that deep. Right. And, I and could he talk- was able to handle exactly. that sensitively with distance from his own That's exactly right. Uh, but experience. in ways that I know I wouldn't have talked about it if he wasn't a black male because I have this sense of protectiveness of like, mm-hmm. I don't want to talk about challenging experiences in my life to someone who doesn't or may not have any exposure to this group of people. Sure. There are so many negative stereotypes about black men. Yep. If I say, oh, I had a fight with my brother, even though, you know, that's just my brother. Everyone has fights with their brother. I also know, depending on how deep I go, that might be perceived as, oh, that's a black male who has, you know, struggles with X. Mm. I'm like, no, this is my brother. It's my brother. But they're, We're a family. That's exactly that's, right. We're brothers and sisters. Right. We have and fights. So, what happens? Exactly. What's it the is. big deal? It is. Yeah. But I want someone who's aware, who can help me think, well, what else might be going on for your brother as a yeah. black male that a white male doesn't think about because mm-hmm. he doesn't live in this type of context? Or, you know, I just, we were able to have yeah. conversations I never thought wow. I'd have before. So I think... Um, Back to the question you actually asked, is ethnic match important to me when I've been the client? Um, It's valuable. I consider it. It's not the most important thing. I mentioned I've worked with therapists who are all different ethnicities, Mm -hmm. and I've valued the work. Um, Sure. I think it probably depends on what we're talking about, but often my experience has been when they are an ethnic minority of any ethnicity, we've been able to talk about things, I think, in a way that I don't think would have come up as easily or as naturally or I would have been as comfortable with. if we hadn't had that match. How important would it be for you if you were working with a Caucasian male or female Mm -hmm. therapist um, for them to address the topic of race in working with you? Yeah. And how would they do that? That's a great question. So I've only had one therapist who was white Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very grateful to them. They actually started our first session or before the session ended by acknowledging pretty much exactly what this article read this article and uh, (laughs) but they did look down at their (laughs) flashcards no i give credit to them they did a great job of being really fluid and smooth and presenting i truly believe it's very genuine and saying i also want to acknowledge that we come from different ethnic identity backgrounds and um i don't know how important that is to you but if if it's important, I want to make sure that's something we can talk about. And Open up some doors it, there. It actually yeah. was very directly related to mm-hmm. something I wanted to talk about. Yeah. And I remember thinking to myself in that very first session, I don't know if I want to bring this up, but this is half of the reason I'm coming to therapy mm-hmm. is my experience as a black woman in a predominantly white area. Mm-hmm. And the fact that she brought it up, I told her, thank you so much for saying that. Yep. That is really related. And I want to be honest, I am looking forward to working with you for these reasons, but I'm also not sure what it'll look like for me to talk about these things yep. because 
when I struggle and I feel like, oh, this is something that's because of yep. you're associated with your race. Right. I mean, can you take that? And she was like, I'm open to that conversation. And that was so meaningful yeah. for me. So nice. Yeah. Whew. <laughs> Deep stuff. Okay. You've had good experiences on both ends of the therapy room. That's right. That way, both sides of the couch. Race. Yes. <laughs> um, I'd venture to say, unfortunately, that's not always the case for a lot of people. It really isn't. But hopefully uh, people like us or uh, other advancements in the field, research, mm-hmm. yeah. training, conversations like these can right. um, help broaden the spectrum and, and awareness of some of these issues. Kristen Fort. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time, your insights. This is a lot of fun. Oh my gosh! We got to come been. back and do it again Let's sometime. Do it. Let's yeah, do it. It's that's been right. great. And uh, she's going to be heading off to uh, Chicago area that's right. for internship. That's right. I'll Good be Good luck. There. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. And you can check out um, her work or her story uh, <laughs> at momentsofmeeting.org. And uh, thank you again. Thank you. Yes, yeah, pleasure. And that was Kristen Fort. She's going to go on and do some great things in our field of psychology and uh, definitely represents the African-American community well in our profession. And, oh, man, I love that story about the woman at the symphony. It's just something very uh, sweet and human about that interaction and what, what Kristen did there. So, Chicago, you're lucky to get her back. That's a loss for us here in L.A., but um, the world's getting smaller, and I'm glad Kristen could make an appearance before she ships off. One thing I hope to touch on more in the future, um, and we didn't quite get there today, but really is the nuances of race and ethnicity. Um, You know, we talked about some things that both Kristen and I could relate to and have in common as non-white people and non-white psychologists. But really, in so many ways, right, I mean, being black and being Asian in the U.S. are two totally different things with, with different historical arcs and challenges. And, I mean, especially this year, gosh, I mean, with the violence and the tensions with uh, some in the black community and with law enforcement, it's, it's, some, it's really terrible. Uh, that stuff, that saddens me. Um, and, and yet, you know, it's not something that I can relate to personally. It's not part of my own experience. Um, so I, I think that perhaps for many of us as Asian Americans, uh, or it's just all non-African Americans, we can only understand to the degree that we uh, try and that we interact with, uh, with our African-American friends and colleagues and hear their experiences and uh, have openness and compassion and empathy. So uh, these, are, these are tricky times. More on that to come. So folks, would you want your therapist to bring up your ethnicity? Um, it, would you want them to bring up their own? And how important is it to you to have uh, a similar background as a therapist that you're working with. And for anyone listening who is a fellow therapist or mental health professional, white, black, yellow, brown, purple, how do you think about or address race and diversity with the people you see? How intentional are you about bringing it up in your work? I want to hear. Let me know what you think at Psych Rally or martin at psychrallypodcast.com. Next up on episode seven, my friend Serena is going to tell her story about coming out as Gaijin meaning gay and Asian, uh, but more specifically being gay, Asian, and in a very active Christian context, which uh, unfortunately can make for, at times, a rather unpopular combination on a number of ends. So I hope you'll join me and tune in to hear her story. 